Hello everyone, this is Kat and welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 49, Chapter 49. Izuku ends up staying away quite late the night that Shoda and Izashi finally find out about his I See Your Dead Best Friend, who is also my best friend now secret. He's exhausted after the emotional roller coaster that is breaking completely at the seams in fear of his world shattering apart for a second time and then being stitched back up by kindness from two people, two parents, he'd never had the luxury of having in his life before. He'd sort of wanted to sleep, but he also hadn't wanted to get in the way of the reunion between the three best friends who thought they'd never see each other again, separated by the one thing that was supposed to be forever, death. Shoda and Hisashi still had lots of questions, and Obro thankfully takes the lead in answering. What about your birthday? We had Izuku at that point, the candle. I loved the cake. I have never loved anything as much as I have loved that cake. Obro cheered loudly. I blew the candle out. Well, I tried, but when it didn't go out, I just pinched it. I guess I had enough energy to suffocate the flame. Thank you, guys. It was the best birthday. I knew he blew out his candle, Hisashi accused loudly, whipping around to face a defeated-looking Shota. I told you so. You called me crazy, but I hoped it was him, even if it was just a nice thought, and it was him. Ah, oh, that makes my heart so happy. You definitely gotta lighten up and stop being so critical, Shochan. Just let yourself feel joy, even if it is illogical. Yeah, yeah. The underground hero had huffed under his breath. You were right. I was wrong. The ghost did, in fact, blow out his birthday candle. Seriously, though, who would have thought that? It is illogical. And so is having a ghost, Obro countered playfully. Yet here we are. Gotta take the reality with the illogicalness, dude. Can't have one without the other, even if it is crazy. I'm guessing Izuku planned that whole thing with you in mind. Izuku smiled softly at Shoda, forcing himself back to the conversation for a moment. I never actually met any of my grandparents, but I had met Obro. I s I'm sorry I lied. I just, I figured you all could use something different, and I knew Obro needed it too. Problem child. Shoda had huffed fondly. No, our sweetheart, little sunshine. Izashi had corrected with an adorning smile shot in Izuka's direction. Always one step ahead of everyone else, aren't you, darling? Falling asleep on Obro's shoulder hadn't been in his plans, but when the ghost wakes him by a gentle squeeze of his hand and a feather-light nudge off his shoulder that lightly jostles Izuka's head, where they still hadn't pulled apart in hours, Izuka lets Shoda and Hisashi usher him to bed, like normal. He is more aware of the ghost trailing after him, perching on the edge of the desk as he watches his two school friends all but tuck the teenager into bed, and Izuka's basically out after that. He is so glad it's the start of winter break. That means he doesn't have to get up early for school because he knows he'd be dead on his feet the following morning if that were the case. He sleeps in the apartment upstairs, not wanting to be sneaking around the dorms in the early hours of the morning, nor to possibly be caught by his classmates, who no doubt would want an answer for why he'd been running from their teacher, genuinely terrified. When he wakes up the following morning, well, it's closer to noon at that point, Izuka's surprised to find himself alone in the bedroom. His gaze flicks around the room, finding Nemo perched at the edge of the bed, but not finding his ghost friend. For a moment, one single second, as he glances blearily around the room, Izuka forgets the events that transpired the night before. That his guardians had seen Obero. Obero, who clung to those two men, had followed them and had desperately wanted to have that, what he'd lost the day that he'd passed away, had finally gotten to talk to them, to hug them, after nearly fourteen years. Izuka isn't completely sure how to feel about everything, but he's also... he's so relieved. Not only had they not wanted to get rid of him instantly, but they also hadn't been angry with him for keeping Obero a secret. They hadn't cared he was different. They'd told him that they loved him. Had people who loved him. He had parents who loved him. He had... He had a dad and a papa who loved him. He's not even sure he can remember anyone telling him they loved him. Not so honestly. So easily. He's sure his mother used to tell him when he was a baby, before he could recognize or really understand, but as he'd grown older, she'd put that distance between them. He honestly can't remember her ever saying she loved him. And there was no one else in his life either. He knows auntie and uncle cared about him, and Kachan to a degree as well, but they never admitted to loving him. There was just something different about someone acting like they loved you to someone admitting it out loud. Shoda and Hisashi had done both, he realizes. Looking back now that he has that confirmation, they'd always acted like they loved him, even if he'd never let himself get comfortable enough to really consider what was in front of him. From the gentleness that only he got to see, to the fierce protectiveness and the genuine interest in Izuka's well-being, to feeding him, clothing him, putting a roof over his head, and providing comfort when he needed it most. To being there when he needed them. Being there 
before he even knew he needed them. Maybe that's what a parent is really supposed to do. No one ever. But Shota and Hizashi had. And they didn't even have an obligation to do so. They'd taken him in, out of the kindness of their hearts, as his teachers who were looking out for him in the early days, and they'd slowly taken him in as their own, as time went on. That's more than he can say about his mother. He was hers, and she'd never... She'd never treated him like his guardians have. Izuku's heart pounds fondly in his chest as he clutches his stuffed cat to it, and he buries his nose on the top of the cat's head, between its ears. They loved him. He pushes himself up out of bed when he finally managed to slow the fondness swirling in his chest and making his heart beat like crazy. The apartment is relatively quiet as he sneaks out of his room. The living room's empty. Sans Fish, who's snoozing on the back of the couch, but Izuku hears voices when he draws closer to the kitchen. He's both surprised, yet unsurprised, to see Hitoshi perched at the table, a mug of coffee in front of him. Obero is seated in the chair across from him, a single empty plate on the table before him as if to mark that his seat is taken. The ghost is positively beaming, when his attention shoots up to Izuku at hearing the movement. Good morning, my miracle of a best friend, Obero cheers. Hisashi gave me a plate. I'm part of the atmosphere. This is my spot now, and I'm not giving it up. My chair and my plate, it's all thanks to you. Power to ya, Izuku snickers, drawing in both Hitoshi and Hisashi's attention. Good morning, sunshine, Hisashi smiles fondly. I'm going to assume Obro's here, and that's who you're talking to. He is here, right? I put a plate down just so that he knows he was welcome at the table. I have not moved since. The ghost grins dutifully, as if watching his plate was an assigned job. The ghost glances fondly over at Hisashi. Tell him that. Thank him for me. Or, or let me do it. Come hold my hand. Oh, wait, no. You can sit in my lap, and then I'll share my seat with you. Then we don't have to worry about holding hands. I kindly decline that offer, Izuku snickers as the ghost deflates with a pout. You made it weird, dude. And he's been in the chair since you put the plate down, Papa. He appreciates the gesture. Izuku waits on bated breath to see if the man makes any sort of reaction, but he seems unfazed. Hitoshi, on the other hand, whips his attention to Izuku in surprise, eyes wide as he studies Izuku. The green-haired teen shrugs sheepishly as he plops down into one of the seats between Obro and Hitoshi. Aww. Hisashi grins brightly, looking back over his shoulder. His gaze falls to Izuku first, before flicking hopefully to what looks like him in an empty chair. That makes me so happy. You're always welcome, buddy. Izuku smiles softly, only to frown hard when something hits his arm. Ow. Izuku turns to Hitoshi in offense, rubbing at the sore spot. What was that for? Oh, I don't know. The purple-haired teen cocks an eyebrow. Expression, nothing but a deadpan. Maybe keeping the fact that your ghost friend, Ro, just so happened to be my pseudo-uncle, Obero, a secret from me. Oh, Izuka breathes out sheepishly. Uh, right, um, sorry about that, but, uh, that, um, was exactly why I didn't tell you. You know him. I've seen the pictures. I didn't want to freak you out any more than I already had, and I didn't want to risk you telling anyone else who he was either. I'm self-aware enough to know that that's a bit weird. All those times he bullied me, Hitoshi pouts. You're a cruel man, Shirakumo. You always look so innocent in the pictures, and the stories my uncles told me. All lies. He's so dramatic, Obro snickers into his hand. Let's shock him. Hold my hand, please. Come on. He knows I exist, and I think it's long overdue that I actually meet him, eh? I want to see the look on his face when I become visible. It's my new favorite thing. Izuku relents without much thought. There's no harm in it, so he leans back, just enough to see Obero's hand snaking toward him under the table, so Hitoshi won't be able to see Izuku reaching for nothing and figure them out. The teen bites back a smile as he subtly slips his hand into Obero's. Holy fuck! Hitoshi squeaks out, chair screeching against the floor as he pushes himself back, gaze locked on the smug-looking ghost. He doesn't look scared, not really, more startled. Obero's elbow is leaned on the tabletop, chin in his palm, as he smiles teasingly at Hitoshi. His eyes are bright with mirth clearly amused by Hitoshi's reaction. His smile turns more humored as he angles his head innocently in Hitoshi's direction. You look like you've seen a ghost, pseudo-nephew. Oh, fuck off, Ro. Hitoshi sneers without any real heat, easing back into his chair as he glares daggers at the ghost before his attention flickers to Izuku. Izuku, you jerk. He planned that, and you played along, didn't you? I thought we were friends. Guilty, Izuku admits, lifting his hand and Obro's up to set on the table between them. His hand had started to go numb, bent at a non-angle, and just hanging. You kind of deserved it. You did punch me. You deserve that, Hitoshi puffs back, accusingly unimpressed. You're both more insufferable now that you're together and are capable of pulling off the little dirty now-you-see-me trick. 
I fear for mankind with the two of you running around together. You can't just jump scare someone like that. I almost had a heart attack. What if I had heart issues, huh? Uncle Zashi, they're being mean to me. You did deserve it, the blonde snickers lacking any sympathy for the teenager. And you don't have any heart issues. That's just payback for you scaring me yesterday. Rotten teenagers who try to scare people deserve to get the shit scared out of them in return. What goes around comes around, bud. Izashi's expression softens as he looks toward Obero, the ghost's own gaze flicking to his school friend as if sensing his gaze. Izashi's eyes water, but he's quick to rub the tears away, instead offering a bright smile. Hey, buddy. Good to see you again. Hey, Izash. Obero chimes back, his own expression completely fond. Not gonna lie, you're taking this a lot better than I thought you would. I thought this was a dream, Izashi admits with a strange-sounding laugh, maybe a bit watery or possibly even disbelieving still. I actually... I've expected to wake up and for everything to go back to how it was before, you dig? Before... Yeah, Obro swallows roughly, thumb stroking over Izuku's knuckles thoughtlessly. Yeah, I get it, same here. I have expected it to be a dream, and then you... You gave me a plate and and a spot at the table, and it was, like, the most heartening thing you could have done, and I just knew it was legit. It's all real, though, Zashi, and it's all thanks to Izuku, our special little boy. Special little boy? Hitoshi snickers under his breath into the mug of coffee, earning himself a sharp glare from Izuku. Izuku kicks at Hitoshi's shin under the table, but the purple-haired teen doesn't seem offended in the least. Mine and show, special little boy, pal, Hitoshi corrects teasingly, offering Obro and Izuku both a crooked smile. Finders keepers. Izuku pouts, lifting his attention to Hizashi and Obro. I don't think I'm anyone's special little boy. Izuku grimaces, going unheard as the two school friends glare playfully at one another over... Over Izuku? He doesn't mention the fact that he doesn't really want to be anyone's special little boy. Hey, whoa! Obro straightens his back playfully, going as if Izuku nor Hitoshi had said anything at all. If you want to get technical, I followed him home on, like, the second day of school, so he was mine first. If I'm not mistaken, and I'm totally not, you two didn't acquire the kid until weeks later. And that's only after my interference. Case in point, Izuku's my special little boy. You followed him home? Shota's voice interrupts from the doorway, brow furrowed. Doesn't hold the weight that you think it does, Shirakumo. Just makes you sound like a stalker. And please, for the love of all things holy, do not call our child anyone's special little boy. That sounds awful, coming from the both of you. If you're not careful, you'll get flagged or something, saying things like that. I guess Shota has the brain cell today. Hitoshi snickers under his breath to Izuku, who promptly chokes on his sip of water. Hitoshi looks pleased. Attention lulling in the direction of the adults and ghost. He invited me! And guess what? Good luck catching me! Obro grins sharply. I can just do this. The ghost lets go of Izuku's hand, and the teen knows that he disappeared from sight. Izuku cocks an amused eyebrow at the snickering ghost as Izashi, Hitoshi, and Shota all jolt at the suddenly gone ghost. Izuku knows the ghost is 100% enjoying his newfound freedom of being able to be visible with just a touch. Obro slips his hand back into Izuku's wordlessly, too comfortable with the touch, smile widening as they all jump again at his abrupt return. At this rate, I could be a master criminal. I would never get caught. Izuku hums back. Does that make me an accomplice, aiding and abetting a master criminal? You really are a bad influence, Shota snorts out, looking fondly at a school friend. Was the hero thing just a ruse, for your true intentions of being a criminal? Rude, Obro scoffs back, looking far too giddy. I'm a hero at heart. Anyways, did you see all your children off, Dad Zawa? Dad Zawa? Hitoshi sputters into his coffee as he chokes on a laugh. He coughs once, wiping the splatters off of his sleeve as he jerks his attention up to Shota. They call you Dadzawa? I've never heard that. Oh my god, that's hilarious. I can't wait to tell mom. It suits you, Uncle Sho. Wow. You're such a brat. Shota scoffs, whirling around to glare at Obero. And you're the worst. I'm the best, Obero counters. It's not like I made it up, buddy. Your kids did it all themselves, and I just liked it. Tried to get Izuku to call you it, but he wouldn't. Stuck with boring old dad. No fun, Izu. Do you want me to stop holding your hand? You're so much fun, Izu. Izuku snorts a laugh. Is everyone going home for the holidays, Dad? Shota nods slowly, taking Izuku's change in conversation, topic, and stride. Little smile settles on his lips as he answers. Yeah, Uraraka just left for her train, and she was the straggler. Now we just need to load up the cats and dump Hitoshi at home, and then we can head home too. Gee, Hitoshi pouts theatrically. At least pretend you like me, Uncle Shota. Yeah, yeah, Shota sighs. I suppose I could pretend. Hitoshi squawks in offense, glaring daggers at his snickering uncle. You all suck. 
Itoshi decides in a pout. Except Izuku, even though he's mean sometimes, too. You two are mean uncles, mean adults, and you, ghost uncle, or whatever you are to me now, you're also cruel, a bully, mean, mean ghost man. Obro quirks an eyebrow, leaning forward toward Hitoshi teasingly. You're still mad I beat you at the game, huh? You cheated! Hitoshi crosses his arms over his chest, slumping back in his chair. Who menus, then shoots someone, coming right out of it? How did you even aim in that period of time? I could barely process the screen switching, and then I was dead. That sounds awfully familiar. Hizashi snickers. Still up to your tricks, then. Obro disgrins, not confirming nor denying. Hitoshi sighs heavily, pushing himself back up and settling against the backrest of the chair. Who would have thought Ghost Boy was just as weird as the two of you? Of course he's just as weird as us. Hizashi snickers back fondly. He's our best friend, after all. Present tense. Obro lets out a breathy laugh, rubbing the back of his neck with his hand, not clutching at Izuku's when everyone glances toward him at the outburst. Shodan Hizashi look spooked for just a second. Sorry, Obro clears his throat as if clearing away emotion, rubbing at his eyes. It's just, uh, usually, um, was, you know, when you talked about me. Obro was our best friend. I missed is, I guess. And I get it, don't get me wrong, was, was... Was was right, but it's nice to get an is. Izuka squeezes comfortingly at Obro's hand. There's a sad look on both Shoda and Hizashi's faces as they share a look. Obro, Shoda starts sadly. Nah, the ghost laughs awkwardly. Don't worry about it. I'm just... Sorry, for, uh, I didn't mean to get so excited. Didn't mean to... J just forget it, okay? Nothing we can do to change what's been done, and I've had this guy around, so it's been okay. As if to emphasize his words... Obro holds up their still interlocked hands. Seriously, Obro adds when Izuka's guardians don't lighten up. I don't blame either of you, all right? I know Mr. Logic and Reason Shota wouldn't believe in ghosts, and I didn't have enough energy to really make myself known, so I totally get it. I gave up. No hard feelings. Don't look so sad. Be happy. I'm happy. Isashi draws in a breath that sounds a lot like he's trying to swallow down his own emotions, and Shota turns away from the group, staring hard at the coffee pot he beelines to. Obro wilts. I'm sorry. You guys are making him feel bad, Hitoshi scolds. We're sorry, Izashi lets out a shaky breath, offering a little smile. We're still trying to, you know, wrap our heads around this. It's not easy. It's so easy to just banter, you know, familiar, but it's, it's so different. And to know you've just been around and we never... We're sorry, Shota agrees calmly. I didn't miss as much as you guys think, Obro offers softly, a little fond smile on his lips. I've liked watching you guys grow up, you know? Finally getting together after a painfully long and oblivious courting session, or whatever it was the two of you were doing before getting your shit together and making it official. Seeing you get married, watching you guys be happy and be damn good heroes and teachers, which show I totally told you so, I have been dying to say that. You're a teacher, a great teacher, buddy. And, and seeing you two become parents, I may not have been any part of it, but... But I sort of was, you know? You really have always been around. Izashi laughs, though he's crying. The bright sound doesn't match the tears that he's wiping away as he eases toward Obro and cups his cheeks in his hands. I really missed you. Obro just smiles. I know. Izashi pulls away to wipe his cheeks again, offering another light laugh at Obro's words. As glad as I am that you've always been around with us. Shota bites at his bottom lip, eyes flicking to Izashi. It's still a bit weird. Oh, definitely. Obro bobs his head in a knowing nod. But beggars can't be choosers. Don't worry, though. I never stuck around when you were intimate, if you catch my drift. I'm a man who respects boundaries, like nine times out of ten. Obro, Hisashi squeaks out. You can't just... I caught your drift, Hitoshi whispers out as if scarred for life, forehead thumping against the table. That's so gross, man. Is he always like this? Izuka bites his lip fondly, one shoulder arcing in a shrug. Mostly, yeah. I literally do not want to know how much Izuku actually knows about us. Shota grimaces, shooting the ghost an unimpressed look. Have you been sabotaging us from the start? I fear to know some of the things that you've told our kid about us. More like helping, Obro scoffs with a bright smile. Honestly, you owe a lot of this to my presence, fellas. Our scared little green bean wouldn't have even considered this without me. Shota pauses, gaze flicking to Izuku thoughtfully, who stares for a second, and Izuku can almost see the gears turning in his guardian's head. Back at the start of the year, when you told me you were a late bloomer, you said a friend convinced you to trust me. I'm the friend, Obro puffs his chest out proudly. 
I told you, I'm the mastermind behind it all. You, um, Izuku swallows nervously. You still sort of scared me back then, and... And I didn't know how he knew you at the time, but he was very insistent, and I knew Eraserhead was a good hero too, but I might not have told you if Oro hadn't pressured me, and I'm, I'm so glad he did, but uh, yeah, he's the one who guided me, I guess. So we have you to thank, then, as Ashi smiled softly at the ghost. Thank you, Oro. You must have seen some bigger picture, huh? How did you know we needed him? Nah, the ghost laughs kindly. No bigger picture. I just saw a kid who needed good people in his life, and you two... Or the best I know. It was easy after that. I know shows all bark and no bite when it comes to his kids, and you're too kind-hearted for your own good. I knew the three of you would click. You're too modest, Izuku shakes his head fondly. I wouldn't be here I am today without you, not with my quirk or, or with you guys. I don't know where I'd be, honestly. He's my best friend. That's something we can agree on. Shota's lips twitch up faintly in a smile as he moves closer, setting a hand on both Izuku and Oboro's heads, ruffling their hair simultaneously. If that's the case, I'm glad he's been a good friend to you, as he has always been to us. You're gonna make me cry, Obero cries out. I feel left out again. Hitoshi sighs teasingly. Aw, oh, Toshi! Izashi coos, leaving Obero's side to catch Hitoshi in a chokehold. Of course we'd never forget our favorite little grumpy nephew. Is this included enough for you, little troublemaker? On second thought, the teen chokes out, slipping his hands between Izashi's arm and his neck, pushing without really trying to move the arm. I liked it better when you forgot me. They get all the cats loaded up into their carriers, and then they load up the car to head home for the winter break. He's not sure what the break will entail at this point, but he hopes it goes well. They drop Hitoshi off at home, and then Izuku's left alone with his guardians. Obro decided to wait for them at the apartment, since the car would be overcrowded between the people who can't just appear places, the bags of luggage they're all bringing home for the break, and the three cat carriers. Izuku's really tired, and he's not entirely sure why he'd Slept well into the morning, even managing to sleep through the bustle of classmates getting ready to go home for a couple of weeks and everyone leaving campus. He ends up falling asleep in the car. He's woken by Shoda's quiet voice prompting him to wake up from the front seat of the car and then they're bringing everything upstairs. Izuka tugs on his backpack and grabs Fish's carrier, while each guardian grabs their own bags and a cat carrier as well. Obro's perched on the couch, Grinning widely, when they finally enter the room, he perks up, jumping to his feet as he heads toward Izuku. Took you guys long enough. Not all of us have the ability to teleport, Izuku retorts thoughtlessly as he crouches to let fish out of the carrier. The cat saunters out, brushing against Izuku's shins, before trekking further into the apartment. Obro sniggers as Shoda and Hisashi exchange a look from behind the teenager. Izuku stands to his full height, offering the ghost his hand. Obro readily takes it, beaming widely at his school friends. They talk more and Izuka tries to keep up with the conversation. He is more than happy to sit at Obro's side and be a part of this without actually being a part of it. As the day progresses, the near-constant touching between the teenager and the ghost has Izuka's temperature dropping, even if he doesn't really notice. He barely acknowledges the numbness settling into the hand clutched in Obro's or the shivers that he's subconsciously ignoring. It's Hisashi who smiles softly, ruffling Izuka's curls as he speaks. I think it's time for you to stop lending your energy for a bit, sweetheart. What? Izuku blinks owlishly, suppressing a deep shiver as the ghost turns to look at him with his head tilted in interest, eye scanning Izuku. Obro's cheeks puff out faintly, but he nods in agreement. Your lips are starting to turn blue, Shota informs quietly, lips quirk downward in a light worried frown. And you look exhausted. How much energy is this really draining from you? As much as we like having Obro back, you shouldn't do it continuously if there's a chance it's hurting you. Oh yeah, Obro hums being the one to sever their contact. Izuka knows the ghost disappears from sight, but he's still plopped down beside Izuka on the couch, even if no one else can see him. Obro offers a light, sheepish, yet faintly forlorn smile. Let's give it a rest for a bit, and then we can try again later if you're feeling up to it. We've both seen what happens when we abuse this quirk thing, and we have no idea what all this touching will do. You do look exhausted. I only almost died of hypothermia once, Izuka scoffs in offense. I'm fine. Once is more than enough, sunshine. Izashi snorts out, though his eyes are a bit wary. It's okay to take a breather. Don't just focus on us as much as Show and I. And I bet Obro too appreciate you giving so much of yourself for us. You've probably been cold for most of the day, even if you didn't notice. We all know we shouldn't mess around with your internal temperature, yeah? Izuka slumps, a chill climbing up his spine as if the words remind him that he is in fact cold. His body racks in a shiver, and his arms wrap around himself faintly as he melts into his sweatshirt. 
Why don't you go rest for a bit? Aizashi suggests easily, so soft and kind. He's doing that thing again, where he knows what Izuku needs before Izuku knows. Pull out your heated blanket. Cuddle into your warm blankets, okay? You rest up when we make some dinner, yeah? I'm sure we'd all like to avoid another hospital visit for hyperthermia. We'll see how you're feeling after you've warmed up some. Listen to your dads, Obro teases. I hate you, Izuku snaps out under his breath, tone holding no heat as he pushes himself up, seeing the ghost doing the same out of the corner of his eye. Obro's coming with me, I think. Just so you know, in case, um, you know, you're talking to him when he's not around. Noted. Shota snorts out fondly. Go lie down, kiddo. It's less effort to communicate with you anyways. The ghost agrees cheekily. So I'll hang out with you. I'm so honored. Izuku shoots the ghost a half-amused look, bowing his head at his guardians as he does, as directed and disappears into his room. The bed is cold. When he flops down after digging out the heated blanket, he keeps under the bed, but it warms up fast, both with body heat and the warmth of the blanket. He melts into the warmth, watching the ghost as he settles on the desktop. Are you really okay? Obro asks softly. We've never had so much contact, and I've never really seen your skin turn any different color. I mean, it's just barely there, but it is a bit blue. Are we overdoing it? I don't want to hurt you. I'm fine, Izuku mumbles into the blankets, smushing his face into his pillow as he lets his eyes sliver shut. I like that you're able to see your friends again. But I don't want you hurt doing it, Obro counters gently. As much as I'd like being able to, to see them and touch them and have them see me too, to know that I'm there with them, we shouldn't keep doing it if you're taking the damage. Izuku blinks his eyes open, staring at the ghost from his blanket cocoon. Izuku squints before sighing softly. Okay, so it might be taking a bit more energy than it usually does. Izuku relents to the ghost, throwing a hand back into the mess of blankets to locate the cat plushie. I like doing it, honestly, but I didn't even realize I was getting cold, because it doesn't usually happen when you're solid, and, and I don't know, I think it may be taking my energy as well. I'm tired. And it doesn't make sense after I slept in so late. I've slept a lot, actually. Obro frowns thoughtfully. You really are too self-sacrificing. The ghost finally breathes out. He's quiet for a long second. I'm sorry, by the way. I know I apologized yesterday, too, but I think I should say it again when you're not, you know, being forced to confess your secrets. Sorry for what? Izuku asks calmly, eye slipping shut again. For what I said, Obro admits softly. I was out of line yesterday. I didn't have any right to demand that you tell them your secret when I knew how scared you were. I knew that you had trauma related to your quirk and that you had valid reasons for keeping it a secret, but I still... I don't think you're selfish for wanting to protect yourself. I don't even know why I said that. Izuku processes the words for a long second before blinking his eyes open again and pushing himself up so that he's resting against the headboard instead of laying down. Obro isn't looking at him, eyes locked on his fingers where they're settled in his lap. I'm sorry, too. Izuku breathes out finally, picking at a thread of the cat stuffy. It just all happened at once, you know. First Shoda and Hisashi were gone, and then you disappeared. When you were back, you were... I'd never seen you so frantic or... or hysterical, so hurt. Izuku sucks in a breath. I hated seeing you like that, but I didn't... I couldn't really help, you know, just hearing that you've been... that your body was out there, and you were back in it for a moment, a ghost reunited with his body, which sounds impossible... That was a lot to process, too. And then you'd... You wanted me to risk it all to help you when I... I really love them, Obro. And I... I love you, too, of course, but you're still... And... And there... I get it. The ghost whispers. Now that I'm thinking clearly again, I get it, Izuku. It was a tough choice, and at the end of the day, I'm a ghost. I've come to my terms with that. Even for a second, though, I thought that maybe... But... But I won't force you. Went about it all wrong, and I risked far more than... I even considered putting you in that position. The silence rings for a long second before Obro continues. I don't know what I would have done if I pushed you away and you... You decided you didn't want to be my friend anymore. You've given me something that I haven't had in more than a decade. You could take it back, too, and I can't stop that. You could just stop talking to me. I never want to lose you. And after I watched you leave, I don't know, I just... I thought maybe you were done with me. That I'd finally pushed you too hard. I would never do that, Izuku assures gently. You did push too hard, but that's not enough to force me away. Friends are too hard to come by for someone like me, so I cherish what I have. Whether you're human or a ghost, you know? You just didn't give me a second to think. I was already scared, and you were scared, and we butted heads. You you hurt me. You know me better than anyone else, and you 
You called me selfish. I know you weren't thinking clearly either, but you put me in a corner, Obro. If anything, you're selfless, Obro offers in a light smile. The ghost wilts, curling further into himself. I was just hurting, I think, and when you didn't see it my way, when you didn't jump on the offer of helping me no matter what I was asking you to give up, I think I wanted you to hurt too. It's awful. I hated myself the second that it left my mouth, but it wasn't you talking, Izuku knows. It was the emotion, the fear. I, I was hurt. I still am a bit, but I know that's not something you'd say. It's easier to know how to hurt people that you're close to, after all, right? We all say things that we don't mean when we're hurting. I still shouldn't have said it. Lobro shakes his head. I really am sorry. I'm sorry, too, Isika repeats. You weren't being selfish, either. There's nothing wrong with asking for help when you know I that I may be able to help. And, and if I can help you, I want to. Obro blinks, stares for a long second before a light smile twitches onto his lips. You really want to help me try to get my body back? There's nothing stopping me now, Izuka shrugs, offering his own light smile that goes this growing excitement. The secret's out, at least to my guardians. We have to run it past Sho and Zashi and probably Detective Tsukuuchi because we can't just go to Tartarus without a reason, but after seeing you with them, I want you to have a chance to come back and live again. It would be selfish to keep you all to myself when you deserve to have a chance. I don't know where I'd be without you either, Izuku. Probably sad and lonely on the kitchen counter while Shoda and Izashi enjoyed being home again, Izuku snickers as he slumps down against the mattress, eyes drifting shut again. That. Obro laughs heartily. That's actually probably true, but also rude. Izuku hums back. Have a good rest, buddy, Obro says when Izuku doesn't respond. Izuku can hear the smile in the ghost's voice, and then he hears what sounds like a book being opened. Everything feels right. Obro wakes him for dinner a few hours later, and Izuku honestly doesn't feel much more rested than when he fell asleep, but he knows his temperature had gone up, and when he stops in the bathroom before heading to the kitchen, he's pleased to not spot any weird tints to his skin. They settle at the table as a group, played once again, marking Obro's spot with them. The ghost still looks far too giddy, but Izuku's glad that something so small can give the ghost such happiness. When Izuku settles, both Hisashi and Shota shoot him questioning looks, to which he nods in confirmation that the ghost had joined them, even if they can't see him. Izuka clutches his chopsticks in his hand as he stares down at the stir-fry. Shoda and Hizashi are both eating, and Obro silently watching as he thumbs at the plate in front of him. Izuka's heart feels heavy as his grip on his chopsticks tightens. I need to talk to you guys about something. Izuka starts slowly, instantly gaining everyone's attention. He almost wants to shrink under their attention, but then again, these are his guardians and his best friend. Okay. Izashi bows his head, settling his chopsticks down in the rim of the bowl, giving Izuku's entire attention. Similarly, Shota's hands settle under the table, but he has a hold of his chopsticks. What's up, Sunshine? It's... it's about Oboro, Izuku admits, glancing over at the ghost. The blue-haired teen looks slightly spooked before understanding settles on his expression. Uh, about... his, um... his body at Tartarus? Mizashi sucks in a startled breath, but Shota just blinks slowly. It's only then that Izuku realizes he'd only mentioned what he'd known to Shota at the beach, and not to Izashi at all. Whoops. Okay. Shota's the first to speak, slow and inviting. Maybe you should tell us what you know, after all, about that first, huh? It's confidential. If we weren't his closest friends, then we probably wouldn't have been told about it. Obro stands, rounding the table to lean against Izuku's shoulder, arms crossing over... The entirety of Izuku's shoulders as he becomes visible to the two men, Izuku gives them props for the fact that neither really startle, besides their eyes widening a fraction, at the suddenness of somebody suddenly standing over Izuku. Izuku angles his head up to glance at the ghost, seeing Obro offering his friends a serious look. You should just assume he knows as much as you know, but more. Ah, Hizashi hesitates, eyeing the ghost before his gaze drops a bit to Izuku's face. Right. Of course, almost forgot for a second there. Okay. What are we talking about? Show and I will need a bit more. I don't think we're on your guys' wavelength quite yet. I actually... Izuku clears his throat uncertainly. I, um, I want to get a bit of a better understanding, I guess. And, and please let me know if you don't want to talk about it, but, but what really happened in there? From, uh, from your point of view. Obro looks intrigued by this, leaning a little closer than Izuku, so he can get his gaze flicking from Shota to Izashi and then back. The two men suck in similar breaths at the reminder of what had happened in the room, sharing a quick look. 
Izuku thinks they're about to deny him, but to his surprise, Hizashi speaks quietly. We were supposed to talk to him, Hizashi whispers. There was no brain activity, no heartbeat, but he was up, conscious. He, th the Nomu, I guess, was functioning without the necessary means to function. Tsukuji and Gran Torino had hoped that seeing us may, I don't even know, may spark recognition or something, bring Oboro back. And it did. Shota continues, voice carefully emotionless. For just a moment, he had a heartbeat, a spike, but it, it could have been anything, a fluke even. Neither of us were thinking very clearly. It was a futile effort. It didn't make a difference. He's still, they're still using you, Obero. Even if he's locked away in Tartarus, we couldn't get through. What if, Izuku winces, what if it wasn't as futile as you think? What? When that, Obero cuts his ashi off, swallowing roughly as he tears his gaze away. When you saw that EKG spike, I was back in my body. Just for a second, I felt... I felt my heart, and I could breathe. I saw you guys. I was... It felt like I was alive again, but I... I wasn't in control. I had no control. I wasn't... I wasn't strong enough to fight it. It's pin drop silent as they sit around the table. Shota and Hizashi look gutted, and Izuku thinks Obero is trembling behind him. He tries to push down his own unease, but thinks it might be showing on his face anyways. What does that... Shota hesitates now, glancing between Obero and Izuku. What does that mean? You already know that he can use my energy, Izuku explains gently. He's doing it right now. We figured that out early in our friendship. I didn't know it made him visible, but he's been able to do more and more the more time that we'd spent together, and the closer we are proximity-wise. His limitations without me are typically interacting with direct energy sources, lights mainly, when we're not in contact, but... Close, he can pick up objects and interact with things in a way that he couldn't before we met. Izuku glances back at the ghost, gesturing to him with a shrug. And when we're in contact, well, he's visible. We believe that's only possible because of me. You both said that you saw him in contact with me before we even realized such a thing had happened. His connection to the living world strengthens around me. He can touch you guys. He becomes solid. His energy feeds off of mine. Like... How you used Cloud at the USJ in the sports festival. Izashi's brow is furrowed. Yeah, Izuku nods. But that could also be one for all. Like how I'm manifesting the vestiges squirks. Those don't really belong to me, but I can use them. It's the same with Cloud, I think. Or maybe, I don't know. It could also be the ghost-seeing thing. I'm not sure. I never got close enough to a ghost before him to realize. I have that effect on people. Obro offers in a vain attempt at lightening the atmosphere. Showed his lip quirks up faintly. And Tazashi offers a breathy laugh. It feels a bit like pity. The ghost sobers, bowing his head thoughtfully. I tried to use my quirk before Izuku, but it never worked. I wasn't even trying the first time it happened when I touched him. It just happened, and it was powerful. I had limitations before when I was alive, but it didn't feel like there were any limitations then. That's one for all, Izuku informs his confused-looking guardians. It's an energy stockpiling quirk at its base, and the vestiges have told me that their quirks got stronger when they inherited the quirk. I may not possess Cloud, but Obro uses my energy, one for all's energy, and I think it may have accepted him as an extension of me. Um, maybe at least. This is all theory, mind you. Okay. Shoda nods slowly. So he can use your energy. That's what makes your temperature drop, I suppose. Just, what does this have to do with Obro's body? I think... Obro swallows nervously, hesitant gaze locking on his school friends. I think if I had Izuku with me, I might have the strength to take my body back from whatever all for one did to it. Izashi sucks in a sharp breath, and Shota's eyes are wide and unblinking, probably aching. Do you really? Izashi's voice sounds wrecked. Do you really think that that's... that's really possible? You could... you could come back. Shota seems to shake himself from his stupor, the momentary excitement melting away into concern now. What would that entail for Izuku? How would it affect him? Just making you visible now is draining his energy. I'm so glad I get to see you, Obro, honestly. I've missed you so damn much, and this is... This is a miracle, but this is hurting him. What would doing that do to him? We don't know, Izuku admits, staring down at his hands. We don't even know if it's possible. I always got a weird vibe from Kurigiri that there was something off about him. Almost mechanical, but not necessarily bad when he's not following orders. I don't know if it's the Nomu programming... If it's as secure as all for one thinks, I really think there's a chance he could retake his body after hearing everything. But could it hurt you? Izashi asks worriedly, reaching across the table to set his hand over Izuku's interlocked ones. 
I'd love to have Oberon back, believe me, but I'd never forgive myself if something happened to you while doing it. It sounds like you want to play with something no one has any right to play around with. We're not going to sacrifice you on the off chance that Oberon might... Shoda swallows roughly, looking away. Obro died. I'm sorry, but that's the truth of it. I saw his Ashi saw him. No one could survive that. You're alive, Izuku, and we hope you have a long life ahead of you. If you're not sure you'll be okay afterwards, it's like we're... Like we're trading you for him. We love... We love both of you, but that's not a risk that we'd want to take. I can't guarantee anything, Izuku shakes his head. But I want to try. If I can, if there's a chance that he could come back, that he could live, and... I don't even try. What kind of hero would I be? One who considers themselves, too, Hizashi says quietly, looking so upset. Izuku looks away. I want to help Oboro. It's my decision, isn't it? It's my energy, my body, my quirk. I, I, I love you guys, too, but I want to do this. I want to give him a chance. Are you really going to stop me? We want to try, Jota whispers in defeat. But I know how resistant your will is. I know that even if we did, you'd find your own way to do it, no matter the cost. We don't agree with this, putting yourself on the line for something that may not even... But I know better than to believe that we can stand in your way. I wish you'd think about you, Hisashi sniffles, wiping away at his face with his hands. If you want to do this, we're going to do it as safely as we can, okay? After we talk with Suguchi and see if it's even possible to try. That means having doctors on standby, having ways to warm you up fast but safely... You need to understand that we will put a stop to it if it looks like you're getting hurt. You're still a kid, our kid. We're going to protect you from harm however we can. Okay, Izuku agrees with a nod. I don't want to get hurt, but I can't not help my friend. Shota hums uneasily. I don't know if thinking like that will make you a good hero or a stupid one. It'll make him a real one, Obro offers kindly. Just like you two. Talking to Detective Tsukuchi goes a lot better than Izuku had assumed it was going to. He's sandwiched between his guardians when the detective comes to their apartment at Shoda's request. It's not technically official police business, and all things considered, this is the safest place to talk, and it's the place Izuku feels safest, telling someone else as well, at home with his guardians. He's surprised, rightfully so, when Oro appears on the floor, leaning back against Izuku's knees when Tsukuchi looks at the three on the couch as if they're crazy when they tell him about the ghost quirk. After one for all. The detective breathes out awkwardly, eyes still wide with surprise. I really shouldn't be surprised by something like this. Izuku knows All Might had told the detective after Shota had found out after the Black Whip manifestation incident. Izuku hadn't seen the detective, but he knew Yagi-san had done as he said he was going to. He's still a bit surprised by Tsukuchi so openly mentioning the confidential quirk in the presence of the two men, even if they both already know. The three adults strategize after that. Now that Tsukuchi believes them, Izuku listens in intently, adding things when he sees fit, and even Obro manifests the confidence to add his own two cents as the conversation continues. It's the following morning that Izuku finds himself being escorted through the terrifyingly hollow halls of Tartarus, sandwiched between Hisashi and Obro, as Tsukuchi and Shota lead them further into the prison. Izuku feels jittery as he's guided along, Hisashi's arm around his shoulders protectively as Obro hovers close. When they reach a steel door, the group pauses as Tsukuchi unlocks it, with a series of keys and scans, Izuku would be impressed at the security if this wasn't Japan's most secure prison. It has to be, to house people like Kurigiri and all for one. Izuku is spooked at the thought of being in the same building as Shigaraki's master. It's hard to push down the fear, as he thinks he might also feel one for all warning him in the back of his mind. The door opens to a small room, and even further in, Izuku spots a glass window. Beyond the window, he spots Kurigiri. The villain is dressed in white arms, Trapped in a straitjacket as metal clamps hold his legs into the chair legs, there are straps holding his bound arms to his chest, an added layer of security. The man's face hasn't changed, still consumed by the purple Izuku had studied during his time at the League. Yellow eyes stare unseeingly, but Izuku can't help but feel like the creature's watching him intently. Izuku draws in an unsteady breath. Izashi squeezes at his shoulder calmingly. Okay, sunshine. Izuku manages a nod. Obro's body is strapped to some wires, and Izuku sees the unsteady, unbeating line of the heart monitor currently being looked over by a woman he doesn't know. Tsukuchi joins the woman at the monitors, frowning to himself before sitting in the chair in front of them. There are three other people in the room, none of which he knows. Obro had already stepped into the sealed room, right through the wall, but Izuku can't join him yet, not until someone opens the door. 
The ghost stares at his own body in devastation, his expression twisted with a foreign sort of hopefulness. Izuku forces himself to look away. There's a general unease clouding the room. Izuku senses fear and uncertainty in Shodan Hizashi. Tsukuchi is oddly serious, but then again, he knows what could happen too. He'd been hesitant to agree to this, but having Kurigiri, the created Nomu, gone for good, getting a civilian being used against their will back, had been the detective's tipping point. Especially with Izuku so intent that they make this happen. Let's go over this one more time, Tsukuchi finally says from his spot. Midori's going to go into the cell with Nomu. He's going to use his quirk. With any luck, he'll be able to force the Nomu programming out. We have a team of medical personnel on hand. We all know the signs that we're looking for. First priority is keeping Midori alive. Watch your monitors. React accordingly. Remember that. The detective pauses, intense gaze finding Izuku in the crowd of people. This is a matter of national security, and whatever people witness in this room, it will not be breathed outside of this room. Everyone has signed non-disclosure agreements, and you are legally bound to keep your word. Whatever you think you witnessed, just remember, no, you did not. There are some nods and quiet words of agreement. A kind woman helps Izuku into his own heart monitor, as well as a temperature reading patch that sends his temp to the computer one of the medical personnel is watching over. That gets stuck to his forehead. He feels like an idiot with all this stuff on him, but Shodan Hizashi had requested it all, so he doesn't complain. He might feel even a bit safer knowing he's being monitored in case something does go wrong. Shoda's perched by the door waiting. Izuku offers a light smile as he inches closer. Are you sure about this, kid? The man looks like he wants to call the whole thing off. He looks like he wants Izuku to call the whole thing off, but Izuku won't. Not until he tries. I'm sure. Izuku hopes he keeps the nervous tremor from his tone. Shoda swallows, forcing a nod. He sweeps Izuku into a tight hug, like the one Hizashi had given him before the medic had pulled him aside to get him hooked up to all the machines. The blonde is watching from his position in front of the window, lip caught between his teeth worriedly. Be careful, Shoda whispers as he finally pulls away. We love you, okay? Love you too. Izuku bows his head in a nod. He tried to offer a light smile to both Shoda and Hizashi, but it doesn't seem to help calm his guardians at all. Shoda blows out another slow breath as he turns to unlock the door separating Izuku from Obro and Kurigiri. He steps into the room, and the door shuts behind him, but doesn't lock again. Midori Izuku, Kurigiri says when yellow flickering eyes fall onto him. He'd been watching the disturbance in his room wordlessly, watching as if he hadn't really been watching at all, or maybe as if he hadn't been retaining anything going on around him. It would make sense if he was a nomu made specifically for Shigaraki. Now, though, it seems the nomu has identified him as a familiar person. A pleasure once again. Kurigiri offers, tone well-mannered. How is Shigaraki Tomura? Izuku doesn't answer. The Nomu doesn't seem to mind. Whenever you're ready, Midoriya. Tsukuchi calls from the other room. Izuku sucks in another slow breath as the reality of all this crashes over him. He's scared. Are you sure you want to do this still? Obero asks worriedly, tearing his gaze away from his body to focus on Izuku completely. I'm on board completely, just seeing you here now. With, um, with me, or, or him, I guess. I'm scared, Izuku. What if, what if it's not worth it? It's worth it if it gives you a chance. Izuku holds his hand out, offering the ghost a tiny yet honest smile despite the obvious fear. I'll save you. It's what a hero does. You're already my hero, Obro promises, taking Izuku's hand into his own. Shoto watches sharply. As the teenager enters the room, he can't see Obero, but he knows the ghost is in there, too. He sees Izuku's mouth moving, talking just under his breath, so he knows Obero's there, too. Shota feels Hizashi settle at his side, both hanging by the door in the cell in case anything goes wrong and they need to respond instantly, but both still with a view of everything going on in the cell via the window. Kurigiri seems unbothered. But what would the Nomu have to be bothered about? It's not like it would know what's happening without an explanation no one is going to give. It just... Speaks to Izuku as if they're companions, asking about Shigaraki like he had with Shoda and Hizashi, like it's programmed to do. It sounds nothing like Oboro. I'm scared, Shoda. Hizashi whispers under his breath, drawing Shoda's attention away from his thoughts and onto his husband. The blonde's eyes are locked on their child behind the glass. What if... Nothing has happened yet, but it's only a matter of time. He knows what he's doing, Shoda says, even if they both know it's a poor attempt at comfort. Izuku doesn't know what he's doing. They all know that. Not even Izuku knows what's going to happen in that room when he offers a part of himself to Obero and, and hopes for the best. 
hopes for anything but the worst. He's putting himself on the line once again, and this time they can't possibly know what'll come of it. Shoda knows they can't stop him, as much as they want to. Shoda knows this. There's something Izuku feels like he needs to do, and nothing they say or do will change that. He's a kid, sure, but he's the strongest kid Shoda's ever met. And with that quirk of his, well, Shoda doesn't know what's about to happen. Still, it feels like they're sending their kid into the lion's den, knowing what the Nomu had done to the child at the USJ and then during the boot camp where it had taken Izuku and Bakugo. It may not have intentions or orders to hurt Izuku now, but it's still capable of it. What if he... Hizashi's words waver off, bottom lip wobbling. Don't. Shota lets his shoulder press against Hizashi, offering what little comfort he can with all these strangers around. The blonde leans into it. They'll be okay, all right? Think positive. Izuku, he'll need all the positive he can get. Hizashi wipes at his eyes, head bowing in a sharp nod. It's a gasp that draws Shota's gaze from his husband's eyes, instantly jerking to the window where Obro is now visible. They're facing the Nomu, hands interlocked. Shota wants to... Look around to gauge what everyone's thinking, but can't force himself to look away from his child and best friend in that room. For a long second, nothing happens. Obro and Izuku just stand facing Kurigiri, and it looks like the Nomu's attention had finally found the ghost, its body's consciousness. Shota feels like he's going to be sick. Shota watches on bated breath as the teenager finally moves closer to the Nomu. His hand lifts hesitantly, Izuku chancing a glance back at the ghost clutching his other hand, and then Izuku's hand presses through the purple of Kurigiri's quirk, protecting his face, and everything goes quiet to Shota's ears. Izuku's body lights up with sparks of green, one for all. Shota knows now. He'd seen that quirk lighting up Izuku's body so many times it's more familiar than it is foreign, something far too powerful to be in the hands of a high schooler, yet there's no one Shota thinks is better suited to handle it. But why? Shota doesn't even take his eyes off Izuku, but suddenly it changes. He can't even process the change. That's how fast it happened. He'd been staring, and his brain doesn't seem to be able to spot the difference in the cell until he spots what's changed. Obero is. The ghost is gone. Everything comes back to Shota at once. The medical equipment is beeping warningly. People are moving around him hastily, moving toward the door urgently. Izashi's clutching at Shota's arm, but he feels rooted in place. It's like there's static in his ears, but he can also hear everything so clearly. The quirk hiding Obro's face from view slowly recedes until just Obro's face and hair is visible. He looks exactly as he had the day that he died, face youthful, unaging all these years. His eyes are closed, and his head is lulling forward as if whatever had been holding it up is gone. One for all flickers away from Izuku, and the beeping gets louder, more urgent and persistent. And it's not just one. All the alarms are blaring. Shota can barely process what he's hearing, and then... And then Izuku collapses to the ground. Then all at once, the room falls to glaringly loud flat lines. All right, everyone. This concludes Chapter 49 of UA Survival Guide. The last and final chapter, Chapter 50, will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic. And as always, thank you so much for listening.